Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is George Buck. I'm a digital art advisor, and I will be moderating today's panel with three artists. I will quickly introduce uh, the artists and their biographies. On my left hand is Michael Reich. Michael Reich is a German artist, photographer. He's been uh, working with different media like uh, 3D scanning, video, 3D printing, also artificial intelligence. He's uh, also teaching as a professor for photography and digital media at Alanus Hochschule in Bonn, Germany. And he is uh, the founder of the Dark Taxa project, which he will be introducing to us uh, in a short time. Then we have uh, Oliver Halsman Rosenberg, who is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and archivist, who takes care also of his grandfather, Philip Halsman's photo legacy. Uh, he has done a few NFTs and has been featured in New York Times and Parquet. And on the left side, we have Aaron Huey. Aaron Huey is a National Geographic photographer. Uh, he's done uh, around over 30 stories for National Geographics. And uh, his most recent project is uh, a work that he's been investigating in the metaverses, in several metaverses, which will be also a, a, a story for National Geographic. Uh, he's currently showing his works in a museum which is actually in the metaverse. It's called the Museum of Contemporary and Digital Art. And you can visit it if you go on Decentraland. Now, before we, uh, we're going to start our discussion, I would like to give all of you artists uh, the time to present your projects. And we're going to start uh, with Michael, who will give us an uh, intro into his fascinating project, Dark Taxa. Yes, hello from my side. Uh, thank you, Georg, so much for the invitation. Um, yes, I'm invited to talk a little bit of my work. I'll do that later. Um, but now we're going to go right into Dark Taxa projects. Um, you can see our website here, darktaxa-project.net. Um, and Dark Taxa is an artist-run project that I initiated in 2019, and that brings together artists that are working on the interface of photography and new digital imaging techniques. I'm going to say something about this later, what this is. Um, there's, some, there's some pioneer works, like from the beginning of 2000s, uh, mid-2000s, but there are also some younger artists in the group uh, who are digital natives. We organize exhibitions, do lectures, do uh, several publications. Uh, here you can uh, see all the names. You can find all this information on our website or you can take a picture here if you like. Um, this is where the name Dark Taxa comes from and I will try first to explain what Dark Taxa means for photography. And I'll give you some of the uh, examples of photographers, some three or four uh, in this short of time uh, to try to explain this. Um, all the works you're going to see are photography based. We don't, in some cases it's photography, but mostly I would call it photography based. It's very experimental. And from my point of view, it's stretching photography to its outer limits. What we see here um, is work by artist Anna Riddler from 2018. Anna Riddler works with uh, an AI algorithm, a so-called GAN. What you see here is the first step 
that she does in her process. She photographed 1,000 tulips, used these photographs of tulips for a data set that she fed into, again, an AI. The GAN is producing these kind of images and these images or iterations, as you might say, she fed into a video. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that the movements of these tulips are steered by an AI, and this AI is steered by the rise and fall of the Bitcoin the cryptocurrency. So obviously there's, uh, if we're going a little bit into the work, there's a parallel between the tulip mania in the 17th century and the Bitcoin hype here that she kind of creates. Now, what are these images when you come from photography? Um, I would say they look like photography, but they are based on photographic seeing models, like you have a central perspective, you have realism, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but actually, they're done in a um, generative way, so they are something completely different. Some kind of AI fiction, dark taxa, as we call it. This is momentarily kind of unclear, this whole field. And also, I would say, what we all do with our iPhones when we take a picture is also um, dark taxa in this sense. Um, I listed some terminology that from our eyes is vacant or dark taxa too. Uh, post photography, uh, some of you might have heard this term. From my point of view, it's come a little bit into the years, a bit dated. Um, I personally like very much uh, photogenetically uh, generated imagery. You can also screen it, but f at this point, please feel free to choose uh, one of these. Um, I um, show you some more works. Here's a work by um, Beate Gutschow. Uh, Beate Gutschow is a professor for photography in Germany. Um, she's working with photography, photogrammetry, and Photoshop to create these photo-like images um, where a parallel or cavalier's perspective overrides the usual central perspective of photography. Also, I want to show you work by dark taxa artist Raphael Brunk. He's a younger artist. This is work from 2016. He programmed a tool uh, to allow him to hack computer games and get to places in these games in the virtual world uh, that are normally inaccessible to users. And he brings back imagery from there. So it's like expanding photography into virtual space. Then there's a work by um, Achim Monet. This is a video. Achimone is sitting right there with a telephone, or a telephone, so if you have questions later, you may ask him. Um, Achim is addressing a digital infrastructure. He uses Google Earth satellites as his tool and infiltrates the Google system with large images or sentences written or laid on the ground to be later photographed by Google Earth satellites. Uh, here an image of his Edward Snowden work, uh, an art in public space project. Um, also, I want to show you work by uh, Philip Goldbach. Philip Goldbach is sitting right behind Ahim, so if you have questions later. He's showing some works at Cetere Gallery, so if you're interested, please go there uh, and talk to Philip. Um, also, I want to show you some works by David Young, which is very far from photography, uh, but these are NFTs, and David Young works with, works with, works with, uh, sorry about that. Okay, I, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. David Young is working with quantum computers. Um, and um, I think this is interesting in today's talk because he refers to a, set, to a theory by the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that in like 10 to 15 years from now on, the internet and the blockchain as we know it um, will be useless because the quantum computers will be so fast that no secret codes or no blockchain, blockchain um, well, they would be useless. Well, a theory. Um, all right. Uh, here's another one of his quantum drawings. Okay, I'm also asked to show some of my work, so we'll do this in two minutes within the dark taxa context. It's very conceptual, but I try to explain this as good as I can. Um, this is an ongoing project from 2010. Um, I start not with something that you would photograph, like this table, but I start with a Photoshop tool, a simple black and white gradient tool. And with this gradient tool, I create black and white interferences that you can see here on the left side. Then these things, or this something that you think that you see, I materialize as a 3D printed object. You can see the 3D printed object on the right side. And then I photograph this object. Um, so what you see actually is the photograph of the 3D printed object in a frame. That's on the right side. Um, here's another example. The optical illusions on the left side the generated or materialized object on the right side. So actually what you have here is a situation where you have an object that's existing because it's printed as a material, but at the same time is not existing because it's born only out of your Im imagination, born of your, uh, out of an optical illusion. Um, then the process goes on. Um, what you see here, is uh, a video of an AI process. I photographed all these 3D objects that I generated or materialized, fed them into an AI, and the AI or the GAN produces new pictures or new proposals for 3D objects. You can see a little bit of the process here. On the left side, you see what the AI, the proposal of the AI, on the right side up there, you see how I transfer it in the computer into a 3D object. On right side down there, you see the real, actual 3D printed object. I'm sorry, this is a bit fast, so you can, you're in, invited to come back to questions with me later. Um, then this goes into a whole process with 3D scanning, um, photogrammetry, sometimes I do video, sometimes I do material works. Um, and the whole thing is a very much generative process. Photography normally is a recording process. This is a generative process uh, where in an evolutionary uh, manner generations, how I call them, develop out of each other. I started at a certain point. I have no idea when I started this project. I had no idea where this would end or where this would come out. So it's very, very um, experimental. And as I said earlier, this is trying to stretch photography until its outer limits or borders. Um, but also this, I understand this as a critical revision of photography. Oh yes, here you can see like what it looked like in an inter installation here at Photomuseum Winter Tour last year. Now, I've listed, I'm sure this list is incomplete, uh, some digital tools um, that are around at the moment. Um, and to say what Dark Taxa project I think is about, it's of course about 
trying out what can we do with these new tools? What are the new creative artistic possibilities? But at the same time, it's really important to look at these tools really critically. Um, it's um, because the whole thing, of, as you all know, has a huge political dimension. We're talking about camera surveillance, machine photog machinic photography, drone wars, questions of AI and bias regarding, in regard to racism and all these things. And the photography-based digital tools are in the very core of this. So this needs to be kept in mind. Okay, now to finish this, um, I'm going to show you some collective works that we're doing in the Dark Taxa group. This is the No Manifesto. There's a little... Oh, we can't hear it very well. I'm sorry about this. You will be able to see this like uh, next week on our website. It's okay, yeah? And then there's the no publication that I, it's 3.6 kilos, I'm sorry. It's this one. It's 1,000 pages. Um, also, we have Uta Kopp sitting there, who's the designer who de designed this uh, book with us. Um, yes, you have a little impression. It's all kinds of stuff. It's super theoretical very sophisticated text, some trash, some memes. We wanted this to be entertaining, but definitely uh, with a claim. Um, also, um, there's in there, there's uh, the dog taxa camera. We built a, uh, a low-tech camera that's photographing not JPEGs, but zeros and ones. And this is uh, an installation, like an extension of the no publication that we did in May in Kunsthalle Düsseldorf in Germany. Um, this is the last video where you can also, where you can, well, we found this form um, with some pages from the no publication with some work of the artists. There you can see the camera. If you take one picture with a camera, it runs all the zeros and ones that all the picture runs for two weeks. So there you can see this there. I shortened this up a little bit. This is a six meter high pole. Yeah, maybe this one. All right. This is the group on Zoom. Um, and uh, yes, here a website and the names if you wanna post photograph this with your smartphone. Um, and maybe uh, my last slide, this is an announcement. I'm co-curating a large group show in this whole field with John Refman, Heather Dewey Heckberg, uh, some well-known artists worldwide. This is gonna be in Bonn, in Kunstmuseum Bonn, very beautiful museum, beginning 2023. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was Hello. very, very informative. So I hand over now to Oli for the next presentation. GM, GM. Bonjour. So thanks for that foundational introduction to covering a lot of topics. Um, I'm going to do a quick survey of like different art and tech intersections that I've done for the last 20 years. And I would say, as an artist, I'm interested in using technology as a tool, not just like the same way artists use paintbrushes or cameras. Um, so there's more of a humanistic, it's not just strictly technical, but it's using like technicalities to explore you know, ideas. Um, so this is a project from, and I'll try to go quick because I, I want to do, I want to open up, have a good conversation up here. This is from 2004. We um, put this laptop out on the streets. This is before Skype or Zoom, and we were having a live feed. There was just like an abandoned laptop. This is the cover of the catalog on the streets of Tokyo. And we were doing this all over the world where my friend and I had this roll of like wallpaper behind us, blank side, and we would stop strangers on the street by waving them over. We had masks on. 
and we would ask them what their dreams or their wishes were, and we would just draw it for them live. Um, so, you know, a lot of in the NFT space now is about community, and this was just like kind of one idea of doing this like decentralized public installation project where, you know, we're using technology to kind of, in, the, in an unexpected way, um, this was like one of someone's dreams. He wanted to be a famous movie director. So there was like a spontaneity involved with it where, you know, one of us would be holding the camera and the other of us would be doing the drawing and trying to, <laughs> trying to visualize whatever their dream was. Um, this is from a film I did in 2011 called Pixel Sutra. So I was just thinking, I love Buddhist philosophy and I was just thinking like the pixel is the ultimate symbol for our time. Um, to communicate transcendental ideas because, you know, the pixel itself is like inherently empty. It can be a part of any shape, uh, be a part of any color. It's not attached to any definition. So it's like an egoless symbol. Um, so, you know, it was just kind of exploring these ideas um, in a more of a narrative form and using glitch and fun filters. Um, so I like to explore technology in many ways, um, theoretical, philosophical, visual. This was a zine I did in 2015 called Organic Cyber Cafe. And I was basically looking at what the metaverse will be, could be, and what kind of potential pitfalls, uh, how it's going to impact humanity and how it can be, you know, a tool for, for the good and for waking people up to their own n fractalized nature of consciousness embodied in a biological code-based avatar called a, our body, or it can just take us into this dystopian space of, you know, deep fakes where people can't separate themselves from what is real and what is what is programmed by others. Um, so let's see, now we're at this GAN, these GAN experiments from 2020. These, again, I had a data set of photographs of bodies and what I was finding was the, they were too low resolution. So I, I also like am the archivist of my grandfather, Philippe Paulsman of archives. So what I was doing was taking my low-res GAN outputs and, you know, taking slides of his contact sheets of Dali or Marilyn and just kind of replacing those images with my GAN outputs to kind of give it this more tactile. I don't know. I, everything I do, I try to bring, like, a tactile quality to the technology. Uh, I'm just going to flip through these for the sake of time. Um, this was an early NFT project from 2020 called LeafCoin. And this was more of a conceptual approach to, to this idea of things being immutable on the blockchain. So I took photographs of these like really fragile uh, leaves that I painted. And the idea was, you know, you can mint, uh, you can purchase like the photograph of the leaf and I'll send you the physical leaf in the mail, which is fragile and will decompose over time. So it was just more of a question of what's the real art, the photograph that's going to live on the blockchain or the actual object which is going to disintegrate over time. Um, this was, these were some experiments where I was really interested in like fourth dimensional photography, I'll call it, where uh, these are objects. These are actually like metaverse objects. I was trying to imagine how can photography become an object for the metaverse. But again, like it's a body based, it was a body based exploration and thinking about pointillism and quantum physics and breaking the body up um, into different points that can be inserted into a metaverse and experienced you know, three-dimensionally and the fourth dimension being time. Um, okay, so here's a fun project I did, again, as an archivist. I was thinking about NFTs and 
using them to raise money for a, a film I want to make on my grandfather. So I have this crate of 1930s uh, glass plates that I did photogrammetry captures of, again, to try to bring something unexpected into the metaverse, like a fragile glass plate from the 30s. So he shot these when the zoo here in Paris opened in the 30s. And I was going to use the NFTs to raise money for the film, but then there's all these issues about securities and selling things which can go up in money. So it got a little complicated legally, but I'm just really interested in this, this kind of technology and giving access to people to experience something totally fragile in, in like a non-fragile state and also just the idea of um, putting our heritage on the blockchain uh, and making that accessible as an archivist. Uh, I write a lot of articles just thinking about all this stuff. Um, I have a QR code later if anybody wants. Okay, so one of my, this is the second to last project. Now I'm thinking about the analog ledger, bringing the analog ledger onto the digital ledger. So I did this series of NFTs of my grandfather's envelopes from his files and just taking out my favorite files and kind of unpacking them. And the analog ledger being the handwriting, my grandparents' handwriting uh, on the envelopes and the digital ledger being the blockchain. So kind of marrying these two worlds of how we record data and I don't know, there's so much to say, but I don't want to take up too much time. So this is the Edward Steichen one. You'll recognize it from the fair. Just minted it yesterday. So we have a couple bidders on it. So, um, And then I started working with, like, this is the last project I'll show. This is a self-portrait my grandfather took. And then what I did was put it into stable diffusion. You can now put photographs into AI and use them as, like, a starting basis so it's just another interesting new like photographic practice where you can give like a text to image base AI just a, a starting initial image and then get very bizarre, unique results. And I mean, then I added an audio track and I did uh, a big animation, but I'm not going to play that now. I want to pass it over to Aaron. So yeah, thanks. I wish, I wish we could do an entire panel on AI and if AI photography is photography. That would be a super interesting one. Actually, I think it is photography. Um, this is not yet working. Technical details. OK. Um, I'm going to share a project that I started for National Geographic magazine. I still can't believe they let me do this. This is amazing. Thank you, Whitney, in the audience. Um, I have the pleasure of. Uh, being on assignment for National Geographic magazine right now, shooting um, photographs using my virtual bodies and virtual cameras in virtual worlds. Uh, and this is a body that I had made for um, Fortnite, for the video game Fortnite. And when I talk about metaverse, what I'm, what I'm meaning is, you know, there are tens of thousands of metaverse worlds. Uh, a metaverse world is really just a persistent dimensionalized space that, that has a shared experience where there are social components to it. Video game metaverses have been around for a long time. It's a new buzzword. It's an old thing. Um, but in these worlds, you can't always hold a camera in your hand. And so in the worlds I can't hold a camera in my hand, I had to design cameras. And in Decentraland, I designed a camera that works as an eye patch that I put on my face. This is, oh, I gotta go back one. This is me at the edge of Decentraland. Uh, at the perimeter fence with my eye patch camera. Um, in crypto voxels, uh, it's even harder, so I had to make my body a camera. Um, my body is an 8x10 camera for a head and, and tripod arms and legs. Each one is minted as an individual NFT on the Polygon network. So my whole body is nine photographic NFTs in this case. It's me in Second Life, looking like kind of like a 1980s novel character. Um, this is my most used avatar. This is the most interoperable, um, the one I'm using for most of my assignment, because uh, I can take it into any number of a thousand different worlds. Um, and when I say that I'm taking photographs in virtual worlds, I mean that in a lot of these, 
especially in the VR world, I'm actually, I'm holding a camera in my hand and light shines on my virtual body and I can see virtual light shining on a virtual landscape and I can operate this thing like I can operate a camera. It looks like a tablet camera, but it, I, can, I can adjust aperture value. I can zoom, I can do all kinds of things with this thing. Um, this is one in Somnium space. I can, on some of these worlds, I can make images 9,000 pixels wide. In some of the worlds, I can simultaneously control the weather and light of the world that I'm photographing. Um, and this is, this is me using one. To catch a moment there, this was somebody being eaten by a monster. But there are kind of, there's, you know, real moments are happening. There are things to capture. Like, I didn't know this monster was gonna come and eat this lady. So there was still like this opportunity to capture a moment uh, and people doing the things that they do in real life. So this one is, could be its whole own lecture right here. Um, people are having babies in the metaverse and I really wanted to photograph people having babies in the metaverse. Um, in this particular case, it's got kind of a sweet story. Um, this is a woman in France um, who was in love with someone on another continent during um, the pandemic and they fell in love with each other, became lovers. They were having sex in Second Life because that's one of the things people do in these virtual worlds. And someone had invented an ability for avatars to become pregnant and get x-rays and go through terms. And you can make your pregnancy last for nine days, nine weeks or nine months and you can choose the program. And so I wanted to be there for the birth of their baby and I got to photograph this birth. Um, I could do a whole book just on this one. Uh, and people are doing ceremonies in the metaverse. You know, I'm photographing a lot of the same things that I would photograph. This was a private wor Japanese world where people were doing whole ceremonies around this bonfire. People are attending, you know, Buddhist temples and doing meditations, like hour long, two hour long meditation ceremonies. Uh, but ultimately where the project landed and, and what became m the most interesting part for me that became a personal project was when I discovered that there was an edge of the metaverse. That at some point the builders stopped building. They either run out of time or they stopped caring or they just don't think that far and it's like the end of a construction zone. And I wanted to know where the end of the world was and I started to find them. And I started to photograph them and I started to jump off of them. Um, so now every time I find one I leap and I'm on like a thousand plus leaps now. Um, I'm minting all these leaps. Uh, in this particular world, you fall into an infinite abyss that sounds kind of like, uh, like the inside of a womb, potentially. Uh, and you see these places really like a construction zone sometimes. You see the unformed elements of the metaverse, you know. And when we're talking about the future of a spatialized internet, billions and billions of dollars are already spent here. Trillions will eventually be spent in the dimensionalization of the internet. So really in documenting this, we're documenting the edge of a construction zone where you know, we're gonna see trillions of dollars spent. Whether, whether we think it's important or not, people are spending time and money in this place. Uh, in some of the worlds, you can't jump off the edge. There's an invisible border. This is in Second Life. I was stopped here, couldn't, couldn't get any further. Um, but I always, I always find the edge, and they're beautiful spaces, um, the way that light shines and hits uh, bodies and objects, uh, there is, I've found this to be one of the most fascinating ways of exploring with a camera in my life. And when you jump off these worlds, I discovered that when I had a flying avatar, I could fly off the edge and go underneath the world and see through it. Because in the coding, some of the layers are transparent. And so, let's say the ground is transparent, but the trees and the boulders are not. Or like inside of a volcano, the lava is transparent but the sparks and, and the boulders are not. So the sparks fall down, the boulders go out, and you get this view of kind of the programming of everything. Um, and some barriers, some edges are walls. They're like perimeter fences that you can't go beyond. And this is where you see kind of like the rebar at the edge of the metaverse where they've not poured the concrete yet. It's like truly like a construction site. Uh, places that have not yet formed because the computer can't load them. Maybe there's a million dollar metaverse mansion on this land that is like suspended in, in, in air. That's not, it's ones and zeros have not formed yet. Uh, and you can pierce through these things. 
uh, so there, there, it's always an edge. And, and eventually, I figured out how to go off the map. And I started to find the void. I started to talk to programmers that could take me um, beyond where users could go with like the god power in metaverse programming and metaverse worlds. This is a metaverse sunset from beyond the 30 millionth block in a Minecraft server. So no user has ever gone to this place, and the builder of the world had never even seen this yet. So as I see these, they're the first times this code has ever been visualized. Um, this is the perimeter fence at 30 million blocks. It extends infinitely up and infinitely down into the water. Um, and this is what it looks like to be on the other side of the fence where users can't go and to pierce down through the ground into what the code is building. And if you travel through this space forward, in the distance, you can see the metaverse being built for you visually for the first time ever in that space. The seed, the seed is building lava tunnels. The seed is building uh, mine shafts. So in the far distance here is this Check, check, there we go. In the far distance is as close as you can get to seeing the birth of a metaverse world. All those tunnels in the distance, they've not ever been visualized until this moment because the coder hasn't been there and no user can go there. Uh, and I'm gonna close with uh, some thoughts on photogrammetry because one thing that kind of sewed throughout all of this was the dimensionalization of photography. Um, Photogrammetry has been around for a long time for like scientists studying cultural heritage and objects. And it's because it's, it's really a set of measurements and often millimeter accurate that's overlaid with a photographic texture. And so really when we're looking at objects like this uh, pot, this ancestral Pueblo pot that hasn't been moved in a thousand years, uh, or this like rock art site, these are thousands and thousands of photographs turned into an object, making this a photographic object itself. Um, and then we can use all kinds of new techniques like uh, decorrelation stretch technology to bring out different light spectrums to see, in this particular case, rock art that we can't see with our own eyes. So to be able to talk about some of these now as photography rather than just as, a, as like a scientific tool I think is really important. Um, these are a bunch of old, old photos from 2009 that I shot when I didn't know that photogrammetry existed and I shot a couple thousand photographs of the surface of a man-made mountain um, that is now decaying and falling apart. And I've resurrected these to build um, an entire world recreating what this place looked like in 2009. So these are all photographic objects made of, in this particular case, maybe 5,000 images that is now an object. And its kind of ultimate manifestation is to be able to become a world made entirely of photographs. This is a world made of 30,000 plus images. There is nothing in this world that is not a photograph besides my avatar body. Um, so it's, it's an entire, it's photos we can walk through. And this corner that I'm running into, um, these parts of this mountain no longer exist because they've, they've, they've been washed away in storms and fallen off the mountain. So I'm gonna end there. We could go on forever with more AI work, but Let's stop right there and try and have a conversation about uh, new modes of photography and how we define photography, maybe even. Thank you, Aaron. That was uh, very, very interesting and uh, probably quite unusual uh, to see in a photo fair, which is uh, mainly driven by an old-fashioned camera. Maybe I, I have a question to you. Um, I mean, you, you're coming from the traditional photography world. Uh, you were working with a traditional camera, and now you're entering this new space. Um, I mean, what, what were the challenges and how did you start, you know, like going into a project uh, like this? I, 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 test, test. I think it, it felt very natural, actually, because as I saw like, uh, like a spatialized internet coming into existence, like our job, like even if you think about the job of a National Geographic photographer is to photograph like the far edges and to explore new space and it was just a new space. So as soon as I found out that it was possible to have or make cameras, 
and make images in a new dimensionalized reality, it was a really kind of a no-brainer that that was just the, the new frontier of exploration. And, and did you exchange with uh, other photographers who were doing the same, or were you basically like one of the first ones that I think people have up? been making photographs in video games for a long time. I think I bring a different eye to it. Like within some programs like Fortnite, there, is, there are really active photo communities of people in that particular case, like making screenshots of like their gaming experience. So what I'm doing is not like crazy new in that respect, but going and documenting, I think in the way that I did, it, it does feel different because I'm going in to try to literally document culture and construction and, and taking it out of kind of video game photography. Great. All right, well, <clears throat> Our discussion is called The New Landscape of Photography, where I actually depicted a, a special title that also refers to a, an art exhibition that took place in the 1950s, which is called The New Landscape of Science and Art, uh, uh, initiated by uh, Georg Kepesch. Um, but also in the 60s, there was uh, a a big movement in computer art, and, and there was, especially in photography, there was uh, an exhibition and manifesto which was called Generative Photography, and it was uh, initiated by uh, Gottfried Jaeger and uh, three other artists. And in 1975, they also published a book on this topic, and it was a book where they basically gave an overview of all the photographic methods, technologies, the way you could use a camera, a paper, etc. So there were like 150 techniques or something like that that were described in the book. And some way, if I look at dark taxa, that's, that's a little bit a, a similar similar approach. Uh, is, is there do you see a connection to, um, you know, this, this big uh, <laughs> project that they had in the 60s and also to the time of the 60s, which must have been also uh, like a, a, a very interesting time where man came first to the moon, etc., new technologies came up, computers, etc. Um, all right. Can you hear me? <laughs> test, test, test. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, definitely there's a relation between Dark Taxa project and generative photography because I think generative photography was um, kind of uh, already, they wor were working algorithmically in the analog space. So there's definitely a connection there. Um, but from my point of view, Dark Taxa project is not so much about mapping all the techniques, but about finding new artistic approaches and new strategies, new images that relate to our, all our uh, digitally dominated living conditions. That's a totally new um, situation for photography and for all of us than it was in the 1980s when I studied. And in the beginning, like in around 2000, 2010, the most um, difficult thing was how do we get, how do we come to pictures that transport more than classical photography and that can give this digital feeling or make algorithms visible. As we all know, I mean, who has ever seen a, an, an, an algorithm? I haven't. Uh, if you try to photograph something like this, it's totally impossible. So all different new ways, new strategies had to be developed. And um, lots of us, what we did is go into the new digital tools because these, with these tools, we could go where classical, depictive, documentary photography can't go. Documentary photography can do certain things very well, 
going to the algorithm, it'll always have to stop at the surface. Um, Aaron, you'll probably know everything about this. Yeah? You can't take your real camera into the metaverse. You have to buy a tool. You need this tool to walk around there, bring back, bring back the images. Uh, so now we have the metaverse when you know lots of us in Dark Taxa project started, we didn't have that. So that was the main difficulty. Right. And, and if you look at, uh, um, I'm probably you're not familiar about this book, but I, I looked through it from this book from 1975, and if I look at some of the techniques, uh, they're not there anymore. Probably very few. Uh, photography archaeologists uh, still know what they were and I think it's probably a similar time now um, where we have so many different technologies um, what do you think uh, this is maybe a question to all of you um, what is the, the main technology that is gonna change uh, photography or that is going to have a strong influence on what is going to come in the next few years. The main tech, the, the main technology. No, the yeah. main technology might be just talking about it. Like a lot of what we're talking about is old. Like these new definitions of photography. Like I mean, the, the video game photography has been around. I mean, we're talking about stuff that's been around for 30, 40 years since we've been using computers, and uh, we just don't see it or talk about it very often. I think that's why you're using the word archaeology is, is like how we dig these up and make sure they're seen. I don't know if it's about an individual technology per se. I, hello. Uh, I'm really intrigued by like artificial reality and, and how AR is going to be like a time machine for us. Um, so I think a lot about archives because I'm also an archivist. And, and I was walking along the Saint on the way here, and you see all these old photographs of Paris through the ages. And there will be a time when you know, a company like Google Maps will take all the scans of a city and geotag them. And you'll have your AR glasses on, and you can be walking down the street, and you can just put, you know, 1900 Paris, and then everywhere you look, it's photographs of the same streets as it looked in that time period. And then you can flip it to 1960 Paris on your walk. And you, you can be walking through time using like a photographic archive, like this blend. I'm really interested in this blend of like the past and the future. And, and then when you start mixing, you know, artificial, re uh, sorry, AI artificial intelligence with that, and it starts filling in the edges of what's not there in a surrealistic way. I think we're, we're opening up the frontier of our whole experience with reality being shifted through like photography of the past and technology, this kind of yeah. ever-evolving technology. I think AI is, I mean, AI is kind of where a lot of this conversation is gonna land because like, how many people in this room have used text to image based AI in the last couple of months? It's like, it's gonna be pretty soon, like every hand will be up because it just became publicly available to make, for anybody in this room to make totally lifelike images of anything you can type. And I think that you're, we're starting to see conversations about that on the cover of the New York Times about the future of data integrity, but like you can make a 10,000 images that are photographic images from scratch in your backyard at night with a computer by punching in text. And it's gonna permanently change the landscape of photography because it is photography. You know, every one of those AI images is millions of atomized photographs taken by other people and reassembled in like a new form of collage. But it, we're at the very beginning, and it's, it's going to be crazy. But uh, I mean, uh, sorry. Oh. Go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, in a s certain way, I think, you know, if we look at stable diffusion or DALI and all these programs, text image programs, um, it's, it's like the invention of a camera, you know, where everybody could take a photograph, you know, like so. But what makes, at the end, uh, 
someone, uh, an artist, using these technologies, mm -hmm. you know? Maybe, yeah, um, I want to add something to what we just said. Uh, I mean, from my point of view, it's really for all these technologies that we're talking about. It's maybe comparable to where chemical photography was in the 1840s or 50s. These tools are there. Yeah. We, are, we are very much at the beginning of this. Um, image traditions, picture traditions start to appear. Um, like in-game photography, we see this. So this will grow and this will spread. And at this point, I think um, what we can definitely say, the situation is dynamic. There's going to be, I mean, within, Daktaxa was founded in 2019. I added two or three really super relevant tools. One was like the blockchain, AI, and now what, you, uh, what we said, uh, text to image. The possibilities of AI and text to image are uh, beyond imagination. Yeah? So I think a prognosis, uh, I don't know if, um, if there's so much use, but definitely we should be kind of um, ready or willing to understand how these tools work if we want to understand our world of tomorrow. That's the really important point. Yeah. And, and just to pick up on that, you know, we're all at a photo fair looking at analog prints for the most part or digitally printed prints from digital files, which is beautiful. I grew up in an archive. I have a great admiration for that. But as the next generation, you look at kids on the street and every kid in their stroller is like on their iPhone. So you think, okay, who are the collectors and the creators of the future going to be? And what is their native visual vocabulary going to be? So the NFT and as this technology evolves, maybe quantum the computing makes the blockchain irrelevant. But for now, being able to cr take these images and wrap them so that they can be bought and traded and sold on the, and collected on a marketplace through the NFT is also part of this technological revolution. I mean, it was really COVID that set this all off in motion for two years. We couldn't go outside. We were in front of our computers. I needed to find another way to make a living. I got into crypto, then I got into NFTs, and then I was sitting there waiting for the crypto to go up or down, and I was like, let me get into AI, and then let me take all these data sets of photographs and start making GAN images. And then, so it's just, it's like, I'm just fascinated by the timing. We we're talking about, you know, the timing of the 60s. I also think when we look back, at 2019, 2020, this is like really, COVID is the spark for this whole digital renaissance because all of a sudden we had time to explore, time to create, time to find new communities. And I just feel like we're at the beginning of this whole new revolution. And while I'd rather be barefoot in India painting on the side of a river, I'm also like, wow, the inspiration is here right now. There's something happening with AI that every image that's generated, I'm like, oh my God, no one in the world has ever seen this before. And it's fantastic and addicting. And I'll be up till five just watching frames render out because it's, it's mind blowing what's possible now. Like you said, with this atomized collection, pulling the data from like our whole history of, of image making over whatever thousand years or 100 years since, you know, 200 years since photography, but like looking back at documenting sites like this Anasazi ruins you had in your photogrammetry. Like we're at the cusp of, we don't even know what's happening. Like AI a year ago compared to AI now is totally advanced. So who knows in a year from now what it's going to look you, like. You can, you, can ask, you can ask AI and text to image based like converters to use certain lenses and aperture values now. Like, you can use photographic tools in a text-to-image base uh, methodology. It's, it's crazy, and I think people don't know that yet. And, and some uh, artists, I noticed, they, they already developed their own style. So you can recognize their style, although they are using text-to-image. So, uh, and, and that's what probably makes you an artist, you know, where, where you find your own language. 
But I was I was also wondering, um, you know, like with NFTs, um, uh, how how do you think will NFTs enter, for example, uh, Paris Photo? You know, like an art fair. I don't think I've. I, you should I've go seen to the, any... the fellowship uh, booth. They've done oh, a really okay. interesting job over there. I'll let them explain it, but it's starting to happen. I mean, I think we'll see. I mean, utility, like something that NFTs can provide is utility and community. Like when we sell a print, the Hals when the Halsman Archive sells a print, it's sold to an important European collection. You know, we don't ever get to have a relationship with the collectors and NFTs is another way where an artist can establish and create a community and also utility. The first NFTs we sold from the collection, I was letting people do a 30 minute Zoom with my mom so they could hear about the stories of you know when she was a kid and Dali would come. So yeah. these are just yeah. different things we can add to photography through like the NFT. Yeah, maybe you can add something. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, as part of my series, my Leap series at the Edge, in in an in an upcoming series, the certain NFTs will come with the ability to go on a one-hour journey with me to the Edge, in which we'll jump and I'll photograph the buyer jumping, and then the buyer becomes part of the series of photographs, creating a whole cycle of interaction that where they become part of the work. And like, I can't, I mean, I suppose you could do that. It's cut off, it's all right. Yeah. One more time, there we go. Now, I guess technically you could do that if you sold a print and you said with this print you've got to sign a legal document that you're going to go do this other thing, you're allowed to do this other thing, because we're really just talking about a contract. We're just talking about a contractual wrapper that gives a person an extra right, an extra ticket, and some provenance, but I think it's, it, wor it works in the form that it's in now. It, it works best as an NFT. And what do you think about the, you know, the legal side? Um, obviously, you're not uh, <laughs> lawyers, but I mean, you are holders of copyright. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, looking at uh, stable diffusion or all these uh, tools that we have, uh, I mean, they are sourcing your photographs, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see a, a, a problem, or, 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 or how, how, how do you think the, the art world will react on that? Maybe I can try to answer this. Jurisdiction is more or less one or two centuries behind artistic development. So, according to me, they're still in the 19th century when artwork is really defined by a subjective author who does something with his hands, and they're not even at Marcel Duchamp or at appropriation art. So all of these DIs, as I'm, I'm not an expert in jurisdiction, but all the AI discussions around this, like who is the author of this, may I sell an AI, an AI work, are centuries somewhere. This needs, absolutely needs to be updated. Yeah. When I, when I was a kid, I remember getting old copies of National Geographic and just sitting for hours, you know, copying some, you know, ancient Mayan uh, tomb mask that they uncovered. I think artists have always been inspired by the past. I think that's okay. Um, I think that as also like a legacy manager, like if someone's just gonna mint one of my grandfather's pictures on the blockchain, like that's not cool. Like I think there needs to be some respect for the art in its original form. But if if people are putting you know a photographer's name into the text to the text to image based generator, you know I think artists have always done this. We've always studied the masters of the past. I mean even I tried to like recreate my grandfather's work using the AI, but just text, you know, like Dali jumping in the air, water, and three cats. And just even seeing the random outputs that the AI tried to give me to be that image was really interesting. So I think it's a dynamic conversation. You know, there needs to be some respect for artists' work from the past, but I also think art is just a dialogue Artists are always in dialogue with other artists, and that's just how we're made as, how, that's our archetype. 
I, I'm also noticing um, uh, kind of like uh, something very new that artists are transferring the f full IP rights, especially when it comes to these NFT projects, these 10K uh, profile pick uh, NFT projects where you own, for example, the rights for CryptoPunk, and you can do whatever you want. Um, and in, in a certain way, it kind of, for me, this is almost like a, a reverse of Walter Benjamin, who said uh, the, the aura has lost, has been lost through the multiplication, through uh, uh, photographic methods or printing methods. Um, in the case of NFTs, actually, the aura of an NFT is becoming more interesting as more uh, the picture is uh, multiplied and as more as it's used and, and as more followers and, and, and tweets and, you know, shares. It's meme culture. It's meme so, culture. So, it's, so it's basically almost uh, vice versa. And, and, and I think that's a, a, quite an interesting uh, uh, movement that might uh, even uh, loosen up the interest in copyright, or do I see it in the wrong way? You, I like to look at history, like the, when the Japanese middle class all of a sudden had money, and there was a, a revolution of creativity and artists who were doing these woodblock prints, and all of a sudden there was a new demographic that could buy and collect and trade art, and you know, the art multiplied because there was just a new collector class, and we're still seeing that, and I, I think IP rights works, I think it's hard with like, photography and fine art one of ones it makes sense with pfp projects to open it up to coo but or cco cco yeah, yeah. all right i, th I think uh, our, our time is almost up or it's already up uh, but i i still want to give a a chance to um for the audience to ask some questions if there are some um I'm just going to hand Hello, thank you very much. Um, how would you respond to the criticism that an NFT represents the hyper-financialization of culture? I totally agree. Thank you. Ar artists have to that's, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. That's, I mean, of course you can see this both ways uh, to differentiate this. There are several topics that you need to keep in mind. First of all, NFT is a possibility. It's something we couldn't do before. So that's one thing. That's good. That's a good thing. I like that. Uh, second thing is that, of course, if you see the whole scene and yeah, how it's market-driven, it's hyper-capitalism at its best, often, but not always. There are also very good artworks as NFT. Yes, so a student of mine said, well, the NFT world, it's a bit wild at the moment. And that's exactly the case. Yeah? And the contextualization and how we kind of get this going so that it's, you know, substantial works. This is work that needs to be done, but as I said, it's a super young technology. Yes, so, yeah, uh, and we all are the ones who will bring this into a form, yeah? Thank I you. mean, I think NFTs are gonna like revolutionize philanthropy for the 21st century. NFT is just like saying a piece of paper. It's just, it's just a way to exchange content and data and when you can like do a collaboration between an artist and a charity and have it on the blockchain as a collectible and every time it's resold, a portion of like the yeah. secondary sales perpetually will go to the charity. Like yeah. I think we're just, it's a revolutionary tool and yeah. it's just got a lot of bad hype in, it's easy to criticize it because it's new, but I also think there's like so much potential exciting stuff there that needs to be explored before it's shut yeah. down for a it, lot of reasons. It's like saying, I, like uh, there's like, it, it's a legal, it's a contract. It's like saying contracts are bad or contracts cause problems. Like, 
I didn't say it, but in, in the, the imagery of Salvation Mountain, of that place that was the entire digitized world, that's a fundraiser. It, it will be like split up into NFTs and it will raise funds for the preservation of the mountain itself through the 501c3. So you can make NFTs or contracts for good or contracts for greed. And I mean, there's plenty of contracts for greed and good out there too in this room. So I don't know. And there's some things that only make sense as an NFT. Like th nobody in this fair is gonna buy like a bunch of prints of me jumping off the edge of the metaverse. But there are people that are really into digital art that believe in the digital contracts that are buying those because it's an easy exchange. It's an instant deposit into my account. It's a different language. So in that community, the NFT is the thing that makes the most sense. It, it makes the most sense to show metaverse work in a metaverse world and exchange it through uh, crypto exchanges and wallets. And it's just that's what that language is. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your insightful comments. I have a question for you, Michael, Oliver, and Aaron. So all of your artwork plays with the real physical world and um, the represented world. So Michael, you 3D printed your work, then you took a picture. Oliver, with LeafCoin, you're saying, okay, where is the actual value? And Aaron, you're doing uh, photography in a virtual world. In your opinion, why is it why is it is that crossover so difficult for folks to grasp? So when we go into a museum, we see this, a sculpture, we walk around it. Um, picture, people have taken tons of pictures of the Mona Lisa. It hasn't reduced the value of the Mona Lisa. Why do folks struggle so much with the fact that this work is, is digital and experienced online? And is it a problem for you? Or yes. do you just yeah. go for this the early is, adopters? Yeah. I, very good question, I find. Um, it is hard to understand, but there's a 100% difference if the Mona Lisa is right in front of you as an object or if you see the Mona Lisa on Instagram on a photo. One is the Mona Lisa, the other is a model of the Mona Lisa, is a communication model. One is art, one is not. Yeah, so this is very difficult to keep in mind because we are surrounded by all images. Also virtual image can be an original. So we are in kind of a trap and it's really important from my point of view at least, this is what I tell my students. I always ask them, where are you? Are we in digital space? Is this an image of something or is this material? Yeah. And, uh, sorry, just one <laughs> sentence, sorry. Uh, and um, of course, Dark Taxa Project and lots of the works that are done there are exactly picking up on this. It's a new experience that we go from physical, material, real to virtual, immaterial, real via a screen. Yeah? We have this experience every day but in the 80s, it was all analog. So that's really new. And we have to learn to kind of how to cope with that, how to deal with that. Yeah. Really quickly, I think it's like education and just it's a generational thing, too. You know, if I try to explain some of this stuff to my mom, it's she, she had a different experience growing up and that's OK. Like I just it's a new technology and even we're figuring it out as we're doing it. So we. As artists, I think we're always like, hey, look at this weird thing and this, and we just keep on like taking that creative spirit and throwing it out. And you know, maybe like a historian like York can look back, you know, 20 years later and say, oh, look, this was the first case of that. And then it it makes sense in the timeline. But for now, it's very experimental stuff we're doing. So it's hard to con contextualize it because it is really on the bleeding edge of like nascent technology. So so it's like an education and a generational thing, perhaps. I'll just say, lastly, I, I think that a lot of it's still just part of the digital bad physical good, like, mentality. Like, I, my DMs are flooded with people, like, so disappointed in me for the, what they think is me trying to say, what I'm showing is what I want you to replace your real world with and not just looking at it as the art or the experience or the documentation. There is a real fear of a world replacement 
of like everything being artificial and everything being digital. And I think people see a lot of digital art and digital symbols and are afraid of it literally taking over their lives. And so there is an inherent kind of fear of the digital. That's Thank it. you. Uh, maybe just one last sentence to this, but because I think this is really important. This, uh, mm, what you just said, Aaron, about the, the fear of replacement of the digital world. We shouldn't be afraid of re mm, the digital world. We should be afraid of losing the analog world because we have it simulated in the metaverse. So what, what we're going to do in 50 to 100 years from now, when we probably successfully will have destroyed this planet, then the metaverse is going to be the only thing that's left. And that's this topic, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's apocalyptic, sorry for that. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that was, yeah. So. That's a whole nother talk. A uh, very dystopian ending. Uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's. Uh, I think we're getting rugged. Let's let's, let's uh, think positive in the future. Um, so and finish up this discussion. Thank you very much, the speakers. And uh, we are still here. If you have some questions, you can approach us after. And thank you for listening.